Hello there and welcome to the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. I'm TJ Hoisington and as you know, I regularly get the opportunity to interview high achievers from all different types of backgrounds and industries. And today was no different. I had the good fortune of interviewing Horst Schulze, the co-founder of Ritz Carlton Hotels, and it was amazing. You already know. My passion and my mission to help you unleash your greatness within. My heart goes out to the underdogs, that, that's on our way. If you think you can, go from good to great. Okay, let's motivate. Greatness within dot com. DJ Hoisington. Greatness within dot com. You see, in this interview, we spent over an hour together and I picked his brain and I asked him questions around creating excellent cultures, excellent leadership, and excellent customer service. And I invite you to listen to this interview. You know, he's just come out with a new book called Excellence Wins. And you know what, I've read the book, it's powerful, it is full of ideas and nuggets that you, no matter your industry, can apply today. So without any further ado, let's jump right into the interview. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Schultze. Horts. Welcome to the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Well, it is great to have you uh, with me on the show. I've got to tell you that over the years, 20 years now of training inside organizations, some of the work we do is in the area of customer service. And I have to say, there's a couple little nuggets that I have heard you say or read somewhere that you've said that I've used in our training, totally giving you credit for it. <laughs> and I got to say, reading your book, um, you know, your staff sent me Excellence Wins. Um, and it's just an awesome book. I spent all day yesterday going through it. I have a lot of questions and what a joy it is to have you a legend on the show. Great. And I'm, I'm ready to answer any questions that you have or anything that I haven't, I haven't made clear in the book. Okay, perfect. Well, everything's clear in the book. I okay. think the book was, <laughs> yeah. written, was written very well. So I look forward for the public to have it because one amazing thing about the book, um, we'll jump into some questions here in a second, but one thing I really love about the book is that you lay it all out there. I mean, you give lists of things that companies can use, you know, modify, but use within yeah, their yeah. own company. I mean, I just thought, wow. Okay, so let's jump right into it. And the way that we usually start with our guests is just to ask them to share a little bit about their story. So if you can give us some background into your childhood, maybe your story, how you got into business and some of the background, which you sort of talked about in the beginning of the book. If you'll just go ahead. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think it's important. Uh, that's why I give it in the book too, that somebody understands what does, how did it all happen? And, and we are all influenced, whoever we are in our, in our life, it's the influence of many that we had in our lives. And so my background it actually starts in a, in a small village in Germany, very small town. I grew up there. My parents, uh, mid, poor middle class. And I, for some reason, when I was 11 years old, I went to my parents and said, I want to work in the hotel business. Hmm. Well, they didn't pay much attention to that. But I kept on begging that I could work in the hotel business. So that was not very popular at the time. In fact, it was negative. An mm -hmm. honorable thing to do was maybe to become the most honorable would have been being an engineer, an architect, uh, or, or even a tradesperson, a, a carpenter, or a roofer, or, or a butcher, sure. whatever. That is honor. But hotel business, in fact, my grand, grandfather was embarrassed, asked me not to say it anymore. I kept on begging. My parents looked into it and found the best thing is to start in a great hotel. The best hotel in the region was 100 kilometers away. Okay. They found a job there as a busboy. And with 14, I left home, moved to that hotel, lived in a dorm room, and started working. Now, before I got there, my parents let me know this 
is a very fine hotel. Behave yourself accordingly. The guests that come there are very important. We could never go there. This is for important people. Mm. This is relevant here. That's why I explain it. I started there. The manager told us the same thing. We are not important. You're not important. The guests are important. You are servants that work here. Don't be envious, etc., etc. So I shared a room with five other kids. We worked every day, long hours at a time. Wednesdays, we went to hotel school, and which was in another town, took the bus there, went to hotel school. That's a very typical German upbringing. If it would have been a different business, I would be in the trade school of that business. Very typical. And then we worked again. After two years, the teacher in that school asked us to write an essay, what we now feel about the hotel business. Three pages. So, of course, you think what you're going to write. Mm -hmm. Back to work in the restaurant of the hotel, I realized when the major D was in, came in, he would have never entered the room unless he looked perfect. Mm -hmm. He only came to work for excellence. And he told us when we were 14 already, don't come to work to work. Come to work to create excellence. Mm -hmm. and, and he lived according to it. Very impactful. Even though at 14, it went sometimes over my head, but sure. it still impacted me. But when I thought about this SA and saw him that night working. I realized, I've seen it before, but I never realized. He went to a table, and the guests on the table were proud that he came to them and, and was working with them. Wait a minute, that was a reversal. We are not important, they are important. Mm -hmm. But I came to the realization suddenly that all the guests think he was very important. So did we, the employees. And when I contemplated that, I thought that's my, going to be my SA. And I thought about it and I named that SA, We Are Ladies and Gentlemen, mm -hmm. Serving Ladies and Gentlemen, mm -hmm. which later became a well-known uh, word that we used in Ritz-Carlton. Mm -hmm. It became our motto. But at that time, I made it clear that he is a gentleman because of the excellence that he created. So with other words, anybody can define themselves as excellent in what they're doing. Right. And, and I realized, wow, yes, it may have in the mind of everybody in my village, not being very honorable what I'm doing, but I can prove with excellence mm. that I am a gentleman, that I am important, if you will even if I'm only a busboy or if I'm a very dishwasher, anybody can define themselves as excellent. And that was my SA. And since I got an A for that SA. Good job. And I never had one <laughs> oh. before. It impacted me even more. So that experience had impact on my life. And that made it to work for excellence and not just go to work. In fact, later, I told myself and I expressed many times, I go to work for two reasons. One, to create excellence. Mm. Two, to be with my friends. Mm. Well, that's a really powerful story. About what, do you recall what, about what year that was? Oh, sure, that was, I wrote the essay in 1956. 1956, wow. After I was there for two years, yes. And then you, at what point did you come to America? Give us a little bit I, of that. I, I, well, I worked on, following that, I worked mm -hmm. as assistant waiter in, 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 in several places in Europe. I worked, I mean, literally, I don't mean that just loosely saying in the finest hotels in Europe, the Plaza Adonis in Paris, the Savoy in London, and so on, mm -hmm. called the America Line. And then when, in 1964, I came to the U.S. in my mind for a year, but I'm still here. So, uh, and then in the U.S., I worked for Hilton, Hyatt. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in 1983, 
in 82, somebody offered me a job to start a new hotel company in Atlanta. There were two hotels in construction. And uh, I, was, I was working for Hyatt. I was very happy. Hyatt is a great company. I had my golden handcuffs. I was very happy with the people I worked. Really loved it. But then somebody came and said, you, we need somebody to run the operations for a new hotel company that didn't have a name yet. And why don't you join us? And, and it's kind of in your hands and what market segment. Basically, I was told, you do what you want operationally. Mm-hmm. That were, those were investors and developers. They, they had two hotels in construction in Atlanta. Right. So I, I, the, the fact that they said, basically, I can do what I want, make my own imprint on a new company that started to create a vision in my mind. I said many times no to them because I loved uh, uh, Hyatt and I loved the golden handcuffs I had. Uh, but the dream, the vision started to control me. I accepted the job and me moved to Atlanta in January 1983. A year later, we opened our first hotel after we required the ritz in Boston, which gave us the name. Mm-hmm. And the rest is history. Oh, that is really cool. So a couple questions on that. How were you noticed? I mean, here you are working at the Hyatt, and then someone comes to you and says, hey, we're going to do this new hotel chain. Do you want to be a part of our vision? <laughs> well, yeah. How are you noticed? That, that, to me, that's a missing link right there. Well, yeah, well, they were developers and money people. They, they had a deal with other hotel companies that fell through when somebody recommended, why don't you create your own brand? Mm-hmm. They told me the brand creation is basically up to you. And that started to create a dream. Well, wait a minute, up to me? What would, what would I do? I'm not going to join the job, but what would I do? And I pictured something. I pictured, wow, wait a minute, the leaders in this world, as far as hotel companies is concerned, not hotels, companies, okay. were at the time Hyatt, Western, Intercontinental, Hilton International. And I said, I would go right above them with a mm-hmm. higher product mm-hmm. and not compete directly with them, but compete with the upper part of their market segment. And I started thinking about it, and that thought, of course, started to control me. And, they, and they, the owners and developers and the people that were here said, that is fine. It's up to you. So did, did you, I accepted did, the job. Did you have a friend or here you are working at that? Was it just a connection in the business world that you had that saw some vision in you? Is that how, why they asked you to come no, on board? Well, no, there was a friend of mine, somebody who had worked for it that, uh, that was running the overall business, including the the restaurant com- chain that Got had it. 150 restaurants and some apartment buildings and, and some married hotels and some uh, 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 Holiday Inn hotels. Uh-huh. Yeah, he recommended okay. uh, that yeah, they right. should talk to me. And uh, they went to a headhunter who also recommended they should talk to me. And for some reason, they insisted, kept on talking to me, <laughs> even though I said four or five times no. Wow. Wow. You must have, yeah, I just imagine, I'm just trying to think, put myself there. You must have really made an impact. Okay. Here's my question. Looking later into your life, what do, what did your parents end up believing or thinking about your choice of career? (laughs) Yeah. Well, interesting enough, my mother always regretted it because, (laughs) yeah, she was excited about my successes, but because she, she, didn't forgive herself that she let a 14 year old leave home. Yeah, uh, right. And he said, what kind of, a, and she, uh, she said, what kind of a mother was I to let you go when you were 14 years old? It was not easy. I was very homesick. My mother wrote me a letter every single day because mm-hmm. she knew of my, my suffering and homesickness. But at the same time, I very much enjoyed it. The work in this great surrounding with these great people, with this elegant, and with these elegant people, the melody that, that really input, uh, input sure. it into me, it was exciting. Was it, was it did, did you have to leave home or was this really no, your desire? No. This was your vision. That was my vision, yes. Wow. And of course, 
my parents helped to find yeah. that job, which was the best hotel known in the region. And I was excited to go to that job. I could have taken a job in a, in a, in a town close to us, right. 10 miles away. But there was nothing of that quality in, of a hotel. And, and, and my, my parents were advised, if in the hotel business, done on the high end in, in a world-class hotel. Wow, what a cool, that's just an amazing story. I mean, you caught, you caught the bug, the excitement, the vision of something you yeah. wanted to do at an early age, and you just designed your life around it. I often teach about that, but I also teach it's never too late to be what you might have been. And so That's right, that's right. right. It's, there's never an end. We can, I love what, oh. you, what you said early about excellence. We can all choose that level of excellence. It's a mindset. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Why go to work just to fulfill functions. Agreed. Why not create, try to take it to another level and do the, the function with excellence? I met a dishwasher, said to, long time ago, and, and he was washing dishes, and I watched him, and he was unbelievable, better than anybody I've ever seen. And then I had a little promotion for him, and talked to him about promotion, he said, ah, uh -uh, not yet, Mr. Schulz, because I haven't perfected what I'm doing now. Wow! Wow. He impacted my life. He said, I'm not perfect. I'm not excellent in what I'm doing now. I said, wait a minute, you need to be. Yes, I want to be. Mind-boggling how, totally. how moments like that impact your life. Wow. Is there, is, is there more to that story? You did share a story about a gentleman who ended up becoming a manager of one of your hotels yeah, or restaurants. Yeah, I, I think that was Ebi. Ebi who came over, came from Africa as a yes. refugee. He came from Africa as a refugee and started working as a dishwasher here in, in, the, in our first hotel in Ritz Carlton. And it, he, everywhere he worked, he was the best. He created excellence as a dishwasher. Yeah. So the room service manager asked if he could have him as a waiter, train him as a waiter. Yes. Afterwards, the banquet manager asked, could you have him as a captain? It's so on, so on. He could. He grew with us until he was the manager of the of a Ritz Carlton Hotel. So Unbelievable. It, uh, what did he do? All he did, he didn't work longer hours. Mm -hmm. He just created excellence in what he was doing at the time, and it was recognized, and it always is recognized. Wow, that's really powerful. It's, you don't need to work extra time. You just need to be, demand the best from yourself, excellence. That's right. While, while you're working. Yeah. And how much more enjoyable work becomes. Totally. All right. You coined the phrase, uh, ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen. You mentioned that in your essay that you originally that's wrote right. early that's on. Right. Um, but I remember reading in the book that there was a point when you were the first, I don't remember the term, you were a lead or something, a team manager or something, and you wanted to bring this idea of ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen forward. But you didn't. You said in the book, I didn't have the authority or the position. That's right. That's right. Well, yeah, I brought it forward in another company. I said it should be our, our motto. That should be, that should, that's, we should be guided by that. Uh, because. See, it guides everyone. It, it says that's the behavior we want. It says to the managers, respect your employees as ladies and gentlemen. Everybody is ladies and gentlemen. Everybody is equal. We're not servants unless we sentence ourselves to be servants. Mm -hmm. We are professionals. We are ladies and gentlemen in the profession of service. It gives every message to me. But when I brought it forward in the other company, they ridiculed it and laughed about it. But of course, when I started Ritz Carlton, I was in charge. <laughs> it right. became, became our motto, oh, yes. And, was it, and was it pretty much embraced? Oh, immensely. And in wow. fact, in the industry, it is, it is worldwide known in our industry. For sure. And it was totally embraced. And, it, and, and we, we made it clear too, to the managers, hey, we, we are saying that everyone, not only you, the manager, but every employee is a lady or a gentleman. We're saying to the employees, the expectation is that you behave like it. You are not, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't act like it. You only are. So don't sentence yourself to be less. Clearly, it gave the message as to how to treat our guests as ladies and gentlemen and respecting them as ladies and gentlemen, no matter what. 
Totally. That's really, that's really powerful, which let's get into some nuts and bolts because those are words that trigger an image of how to behave. Ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and yeah. gentlemen, right? And then yes. you, you talk about in chapter two that there are words have meaning and that yeah. certain, certain, yeah. certain <laughs> yeah. words should be used and certain words shouldn't be used. Yeah. You know I mean? yeah. Is it that's kind of it, it, that had to happen? You see, we, you have to understand in our business, most of our shops are minimum wage shops in the in the hotel, busboy, doorman, bellman, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, mates. But they're dealing in a in a risky hotel. These employees that we hire from Center City, they're dealing with the chairman of the board from the Bank of England. Right. In, in, in short moments, in moments of tra transaction, how do we make sure that we, those employees, are elegant in this moment? Mm -hmm. So, we, so I, I su simply ask, eliminate three, word in re three words and replace them. Number one, eliminate hi. If I say hi to you, I, I'm saying I'm equal level. If I say, good morning, sir, good morning, ma'am, I lifted it up. So with other words, instead of hi, we say good morning, welcome. So eliminate hi. And the next elimination I want to have of words is folks, guys, dudes, whatever yeah, they would say. Right. So they said they're ladies and gentlemen, so call them sir, ma'am, or whatever. And then eliminate okay. Instead of saying, I would like, if the guest said, I would like another pillow, instead of saying, okay say my pleasure i'm happy to do this so in this moment the transaction moves to elegance rather than than a, a street language and that is so and, and, and so consequently guests always compliment how elegant our employees were because the transaction between employee and guest is very short most of the time very limited but if it stays with him, this elegant framework, the, the guests are am, 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 am amazed. How did you institutionalize that in terms of how did you make that? This is, uh, how, this is how we do it around here. Was it some initial training? And then I think I read in your book, before every shift, you guys would do a little kind of a powwow. Yeah. I don't know. I forget yeah, what you yeah, call it. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, that's the thing. There's, they have to. I, I see often. I deal with many companies and, and they, they all believe that service is important mm -hmm. and they have processes for the production of their product. They have processes for the timeliness, but they don't have a process to accomplish that service, that, that, that interaction between employee and customer or employee and guest or employee and patient, whatever you, whatever you call it. Right. So we made sure there's a process, and the process was we, we taught this particular in the actions the first day an employee start, comes to work because it is behavior, and behavior is very hard to teach unless there is a significant emotional event in a person's life. Mm -hmm. And the first day of work is a significant emotional event. That's when we talked about those behaviors. We then take, we, by the way, we had 24 points that we taught the first couple of days of work. Right. Nothing to do with the function of work, all with basically with behaviors. We taught them the first two days. And then that is the process. We, the process was we select the right employees and we orient right. That's what I just explained. The, after that, we teach the function. And after that, we sustain those 24 points by repeating one of the points every day. Every day before every shift, mind you, we are 24 hour business. Mm -hmm. So today's, today it may be point 11. Right. And, and it is being taught in every, for every shift in every hotel around the world. Oh, point really? 11, so they're all point on 11, the same? Okay. Say on the same basis. So the same messages are given. If you're a brand, brand, the same message must be given. Otherwise, you're not a brand. 
Right. So we give right. we, we give the same message today, maybe point eleven. If you get a complaint, you own it. Yeah. In other words, if you're the waiter and you ask the guest in the morning, I hope you had a good night, and the guest says, No, I, I'm annoyed because my TV change I didn't work. Mm-hmm. In that moment, the waiter owns the complaint and says, please forgive me. In fact, I feel so bad, I will buy your breakfast. You see, that is alignment. The way that will take over, will accept the complaint. That's what he learns today. In 24 days, he will hear the same explanation again, as well as hearing about not using the right phrase, the right word. It's one of those 24 points. And it's repeated every 24 days. That's sustaining what you teach. Correct. So it's that repetition. You talk about that in the book, which is... We call it line up, by the way. Yeah, yeah, right. And it's constant. So you're always touching on those key points. Now, on the whole forgiveness and... um, Uh, You you talk about in the book that there's a lot of stonewalling that takes place inside many organizations. In fact, some organizations... um, encourage their people to stonewall. Like if you get in a car sure. accident, right? Sure. You, have, you talk about an insurance company <laughs> that you don't name, but you talk about that insurance company who says, whatever you do, you know, don't yeah. admit to the mistake. And your point is, no, a higher level of ex, uh, excellence is that you do say, please forgive me, I'm yeah. sorry, right? And then fix the problem. Do you find a couple things? In the culture that we live in that is so litigious, yeah. right, do you, yeah. did you still demand that or expect that of your people? Yes, I do. Mm-hmm. Yes, no, let me explain that. That's Good. very important. In fact, they have a whole section in the book about problem resolution. Right. Based, based all on facts. I mean, all the stuff that I write is based on absolute facts. Right. And the problem resolution, it's very simple. And here's the facts. 96%, we know that, we analyze that, not we, others have analyzed that. 96% of guests who complain only want to get rid of their frustration. Mm. So, but if you then say, well, I don't think it happens here, or I call a manager, they didn't get rid of their frustration. What has to happen is whoever gets to complain owns to complain. That's like good. I just explained with the, Yep. With a waiter in the morning and says, please forgive me. In that moment, most of the 96% feel even embarrassed that they ever complained. Mm. So 96% is taken care of. And by the way, a little bit over 3% have a legitimate reason to complain. They should be taken care of. We, we messed up. Yeah. So clearly we should say, we are sorry, please forgive us and make corrections. Now, we also know, frankly, and I'm scared to even say it because everybody will shove this now into the 96% or whatever. We we also know that not quite 1% just want to complain and want something. Mm -hmm. But it's very rare. It's very rare. And so, so you have to know, but it's a very small percentage but we cannot, but then businesses handle it as if everybody is in that boat. No, not everybody. 96% only want somebody are frustrated by about what happened. And if you don't properly say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, they become loyal customers. Yeah. That's the point. In fact, you make the point, and we've made it in our little training as well, that when there's a problem and you go to resolve that problem sincerely, that's a great opportunity to strengthen loyalty. Oh, absolutely creates loyalty. Yeah. And why do you think that many leaders um, in many companies don't maybe share some of this vision of putting yourself out there, asking for forgiveness, saying, I'm sorry, we'll get this fixed, we'll take care of it, you know, that whole mindset? Well, particularly in growing companies, it's very understanding. Uh, something happened, uh, as you say, we're litigious, and somebody's being sued, and one employee said the wrong thing, and because of that, the lawsuit is going to be lost. So what happens? A new rule is created in the organization. Mm-hmm. 
particularly large organization, a new rule to make sure this never happens again. Right. And pretty soon it's a rule and everybody's done afraid to step out and, and say, please forgive me. Mm -hmm. And right away say, well, I don't understand it. That never happened before. And all those excuses are being created, which, which, which don't do anything. But why would I do that when I know already 96% all they want to do is say it? That's all. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, that's really, that's really good for our listeners to hear how important it is to be human. I mean, just be yeah. real with people. And that, that, won't, that not only affects the relationship with customers, right? Imagine if you apply, right. applied that that's in right. your home. Imagine that's if right. you applied that to your children, right? That's right. I'm sorry, please forgive me. I overreacted or whatever. the. Yeah, right. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Or the children say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Don't they do? <laughs> And I only, I only say that because I've done it with my own kids. <laughs> yeah, I do too. <laughs> so, okay. So on the, the thought of complaints and customers and so forth, I read somewhere and I want to get your verification if I've been saying it correctly. Is it true, just because I've read it somewhere, is it true that your employees were given a $2,000 allowance <laughs> to yeah. satisfy or rectify or improve a situation, but that never once has the full $2,000 ever been used or something to that. Absolutely correct. Every employee was empowered to make a decision up to $2,000 if it came to keeping a customer, to avoid losing a customer. Mm -hmm. Look, uh, this was, when I, when I started, I, I, Everybody was shocked. My whole organization was totally shocked. Uh -huh. and owners, uh, owners, investors were totally shocked. Threatened to sue me, in fact, that every employee, you mean a busboy? Well, mind you, I, I, it was an economic decision. We knew the average age of each customer, the average age of our market, which was in early 40s, I knew they could travel about 30 more years. I knew how often they spend, the repeater spent in our hotel, right. how much they spent. So I knew a good customer was worth about $150,000 to $200,000 lifetime. Why wouldn't I invest $2,000 to keep them? I also knew that nobody would spend $2,000. They bought a glass of wine. They bought breakfast. They did something to make the customer loyal, which, which is much cheaper than advertising for new customers. That is really powerful. Wow, that's really powerful. You also said never, uh, never accept the belief that 30% of your guests or customers won't return. There's that common thing that we're gonna lose 30% of our customers anyway. It, 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 that's terrible. The decision of an organization have to, has to be, we don't lose God. In fact, the yeah. most important concentration of an organization should be not to lose customers, to create loyal customers. Right. What, what is a great organization? I address that in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. A great organization, number two, number one keeps the customers, creates loyal customers. Mm -hmm. and, and then, Number two, three, and four can never encroach in number one. Number two, find new customers, advertising, promotion, and so on, but mostly through the existing customers. Mm -hmm. Number three, get as much money from the customer as you can. Now, what do I mean with that? A loyal customer buys more because loyalty means nothing more than they trust you. And once they trust you, they buy more products from you. They use your hotel more often, they use your store, they buy more things from your store and so on because they develop trust in you. Right. That's what I mean with that. And, and, and number four, what you do is efficiency. You do it all efficiently and work continuous improvement in your efficiencies and so on. So rather, I want to really highlight that, efficiency versus cost cutting. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we miss construe efficiency with cost cutting. In a hotel, anybody can con cost, cut cost. Anybody, I can walk into any hotel in the world and cut cost. I take right. the flowers away. Mm -hmm. 
or or eliminated the piano playing and a cut cost. But I took it away from the guest. Efficiency means you're if more efficient, but you don't take anything away from the guest. Mm. So you, you know, what I imagine not having worked in your company, having stayed in, in, in Ritz Carlton and so forth over the years, th- you must have created a strong sense of trust and respect throughout the organization. I mean, they had to, they, I just imagine that they fell in love with your concept. I think it was a noble ideal that they were moving toward. And it just sounds like because of your influence and teaching this, that they embraced it. Were, were there ever people that didn't embrace it? Oh, yeah, sure. But uh, I want to emphasize here, uh, I, I'm, I'm talking, so there's, I'm saying I, and I did. It wasn't only I. There were For some, sure. some sure. exceptional people there with me helping it, and which, which created the success of Ritz Carlton. <laughs> I was one, one of the guys, obviously, I was, was the operation leader, but, but others were very important in, in accomplishing. But yes, there were people, and that's very clear, that we had to let go, that didn't embrace it. In fact, mm. that, that, that were embarrassed about our, 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 our slogan, our, our, our ladies and gentlemen, they felt it silly. They were embarrassed about our, our creed that we had as an organization and so on and so on. And they, they, they found it silly yeah, and, and right. or could not apply, adjust to that culture. But at the same time, there was an amazing amount of trust in the organization. Our turnover, to give you an idea, our employee turnover, while the industry, mm. in the US, I'm talking US now, okay. in the industry, restaurant, hotel was over 100%. Ours was under 20. We didn't pay more. We never became union. We inherited some union. For instance, San Francisco, the hotel opened in a city where everybody's union. Right. For three years, I was picketed, and, but we didn't become union because we had an environment of belonging and purpose. People felt they belong. People felt they're part of the organization, part of what we say. They were proud to be part of it. That is powerful. And I agree with your point that you highlighted. It is true. None of us get to the top alone. It takes other people on the team. Yeah. And when, you're, when leaders are willing to share, just like you did here in the interview, share um, this belief that everybody played a role, I, I tell you what, yeah. it, it builds trust and it builds respect. And then- yeah, I, I, I have to, I, I want to recount a little story that happened to me about two years ago, one and a half years mm. ago. Okay. I was in a, in a meeting of the five-star award winners, five-star hotel award winners in New York from around the world. They get the greatest recognition in our business, five-star. And in the room were about 500 people. And when it was announced that Horst Schulze is in the room, everybody stood up and applauded. Now, whom do they really applaud? Did they applaud me? That's not true. They applauded the image of Ritz Carlton. Mm-hmm. which was created by busboy, doorman, bellman, maids, chefs, great managers, great vice presidents, everybody didn't applaud me. Yeah. It was the image of Ritz-Carlton. On the other hand, and that's what I mean, define yourself. We define ourselves as excellent. That's why when, when, an, when a Ritz-Carlton employee looks for a job and there are 100 others, the Ritz-Carlton employee gets it because of the image. Mm-hmm. that is created by everybody. And so I, I'm fully aware it wasn't me. And in fact, I was embarrassed to think, gee, I would just love to applaud those 24,000 employees that worked when I left Ritz Carlton. Well, That's it. Well said. That is really cool that you, that you have that mindset. Wow. Um, okay, so I lo- I'm going to read a short story that you shared in the book. I thought it was uh, really interesting. <laughs> I'm looking forward. <laughs> okay, here we go. <clears throat> you said, when I first came to America as a young man, I worked as a waiter in a French restaurant in San Francisco. All the other waiters, it seemed, were French, and I was the only German. 
they would talk to each other condescendingly about customers who didn't even know how to quote properly handle a knife and a fork. <laughs> the, 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 the manners of Paris were the right way to do things. And these uncultured Americans were obviously, they didn't get it. I could sense a sense of arrogance and how they approached each table of guests. It went against everything I had been taught years before by my first maitre d' when I was still a teenager. Weren't these guests paying the bill that supported all of our salaries? Shouldn't we be treating them with respect and honor? Didn't we want them to come back and spend more money with us on other nights? The food in the restaurant was excellent. The chef and his team definitely knew what they were doing. The furnishings were elegant, even so. Within a year, the restaurant went out of business. People had picked up on the hostile vibe in the air, and they stopped coming. And I love this last statement you said in the book, just to highlight. Elegance without warmth is it's arrogance. Is arrogance. Right. That's, that's a typical summer. Now, now, mind you, the, the restaurant was in business for five years. It wasn't, but only one year that I was there. You know, sure. so it was sure. beforehand four years in business. Yes, there was, the, you know, when a guest when a guest comes into a restaurant, they, they don't really come there to eat. They come right. there for an experience. They have food at home, and the experience is, of course, the food. It is the overall feeling that you establish by the by the service, by the caring, by the respect that you give, by honoring that guest. Mm. I, I, that all that is called service. All that is called service. It's not uh, ser serving people in a restaurant. It's not bringing food over. Unfortunately, that's how it is interpreted often. Right. It, well, and you talk later in the book. The, the cool thing about the book is you give all these um, nuggets. <clears throat> yeah. In the beginning of how to deliver excellent customer service. And then you have part two of the book, which is all about leadership and vision and how to kind of pull it together. And one of the things that you, you talk about were results-driven leaders that sometimes you notice didn't get the soft, well, you didn't say this, this is me speaking here, the soft, mm -hmm. fluffy stuff. That the, yeah. I'm, I'm imagining that the soft, yeah. fluffy stuff yeah. in your definition really is the real stuff that matters. That's right. Well, yeah, the managers don't get that. Yeah, right. Leaders get that. Mm. Managers are there to just make things happen and develop a bottom line, which we all are. And some of some are very successful doing that and run a very successful business. But there is no feel behind it. There is no, mm. and, and in most cases, or nearly all cases, there is, there is no purpose behind it. There's no future purpose. A leader has purpose and gives people purpose. A leader agonizes about the purpose that he or she has. A leader for the organization, for the department, for the, for the business unit. What is the purpose? Where am I going to be in two, three, four, five years? Yes. Is this purpose good for all concerned? That's what a leader agonizes about. Is it, is it good for the employees, my purpose? Is it good for the investors? Right. Is it good for, for society? Is it, is it good for all concerned? And that works for that purpose. And that includes the fluff and the feeling. That means everybody is aligned. That means right. employees can help thinking how to go on purpose. Employees have a purpose. And you know, you go back to Aristotle who said, life is only of real value if you have a great purpose and a belonging. And, and why wouldn't we give our employees a purpose? A manager works without purpose. The purpose of manager is the bottom line today. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the difference between leaders and, and, and managers. Leaders, managers make this happen, the business. But there is no concern how does it impact the life of my employees? How does it really impact the company even for long term? These are no, no evaluations of a manager, but of a leader, they are. 
No, that, that is really important. You said in the book, you talk about love your neighbors yourself at one point, but then you also, okay, here we go. If it's okay, I'm going to read another story. I think our audience, <laughs> will get, because, because then you can speak to it, right? Because yeah, okay. It, it all has to do with feedback. And it's, I could get a sense through reading in the book, um, you desired the feedback from your people when you said early on in the it's book. Essential. Yeah, you said uh, Dana Point, your, 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 your place down at uh, Dana Point, Ritz-Carlton, that they had the checkout time at noon, and you started getting all these, you know, you kept having complaints. And so you did a little research, got some feedback, and you figured out, well, why don't we change it to 3 p.m.? And then later on you said, let's take it out all together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There yeah, was no check-in. Yeah, but, but it, because it, you see, those are those check-in time, check-in time thing outside. They're just industry norms, and you do it. You do those things for the convenience of the of the hotel, not for the customer. Right. So that all maids can start a certain time, and they all are informed a certain time. They all start at eight. They're being told. They're getting the equipment. They go to the floor and start cleaning. And we, we said, well, that is why, that's why we, we need this checkout time altogether. We need, you, you need to get out of here because we have other people check in. And so we need the rooms to be ready. Now, why not have a couple of maids start at six o'clock in the morning? Mm -hmm. Because some people check out early and immediately hit those rooms, clean them, and we have, we have enough rooms ready for people checking in. That's it all it took to, for us to make an adjustment in order to please the guest. Right. But, but we become so ingrained in systems that it doesn't matter anymore. It is to the inconvenience of the customer. Mm. It has to be customer. And I try the whole book. I'm trying to first, be, as you just alluded, talk about the customer. Then in a way, people, the employee, if you will, and then leadership. And, 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 and then, of course, put always at, at into it the system as to the process of how to accomplish it. That's right. You, know. you, you said here, the story I was going to share was this. You said, you said, some bosses are still mired in the Great Depression thinking. You said uh, they learned from the managers of that era. era. I remember a certain hotel manager in Hong Kong who listened as I talked with his room service staff. I was saying things like, you are empowered here. I want you to say what is wrong so that we can improve. What can we do better in this hotel? Talk to <laughs> us about these things, you said. At the end of the meeting, the manager said, excuse me, Mr. Schultz, I am quitting. I was yeah. surprised. I was surprised. I was shocked. I was You're shocked. He said, why? Hey, what is the problem? You're allowing the employees to speak up, he answered forthrightly. I am the boss, not them. And at the end of the week, he left. You know what? I have yeah. found this to be one of the questions we ask in one of our training programs, Maximizing Human Performance. We ask that question. What are, idea, what are processes or routines or self-talk within the organization collectively that may not be serving the organization. And I got to tell you, there's some organizations that easily will come back with, hey, this is what we can work on. This is what we think. And oftentimes, those visionary leaders are in the room. And you can always get a sense of the leader and the relationship because you know that they're constantly asking for this input. But I've been yes. in other organizations where people – wouldn't say a thing. I mean, I would sit there for a couple minutes and you're just waiting for the first person to say something. And it's just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, but, but the interesting thing is, if <laughs> those organizations where they're afraid, they have an open door policy, except nobody is af everybody is afraid to go through the door. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all, those, all those slogans, the silly slogan, open door policy and all those things... <laughs> Uh, and their slogans, unfortunately, are not really true most of the time. And, and, and here's the crazy thing. 
if I get all the, if I get feedback, we are begging our employees to give us feedback. Tell us what we did wrong. Tell us what you see wrong so that we can eliminate the root cause of the wrong and consequently be better, consequently improve. That is efficiency, by the way. Every time I eliminate a mistake permanently, I'm becoming, my product becomes better and the cost goes down. Right. Now, why wouldn't I want to know from every person who sees a, def- a problem, why wouldn't I want everybody to speak up so we can lower the cost and improve the product? Right. It's almost like people sometimes are afraid of ridicule or they're afraid yeah. of, of getting in trouble in some form or another. And it, well, takes- it is, well, that's why I, by the way, that's why I'm referring to the old manager, if you want. And that doesn't mean that every old manager was bad. But right. they, they learned Taylorism. And, and Taylor taught, mm-hmm. we management think and they, the employees, do. The employees have no right to think. They do their little job on the, on the, uh, on the, on the manufa- in the manufacturing, on the band. They tighten those four screws. We think. And the next one puts on the door to the other car or whatever. But they are not thinking. We think. And this crazy teaching, still, we are still with one foot in it. Yeah. Let's face it. Right. We are still with one foot in it. That's Taylorism. And, and, and it is so terribly wrong that because the guy that sits on this construction band knows better how to do this particular job than anybody in the office totally. and could possibly improve it. Yep. But we don't listen to them. We, say, we basically said, now a long time ago, we don't say it quite like that anymore. They're stupid and we are not. What a horrible, immoral thing to do. I, I, I just worked this Saturday for a major car maker and um, I was meeting with a big group of people and they said, you know, it was several years ago, we had this little thing on the wall. You could put an anonymous uh, thought or an opinion or something that could help the organization mm-hmm. succeed in. And it said about yeah. three years ago or four years ago, they took it out and they know. Me. So I asked them, I happen to have these three by five cards. And I said, okay, anonymously. And I handed out all these cards. I go, what needs to happen to help your organization hum at the level the vision is at? And, yeah. and I tell you what, I think of the 50 people in the room, I think I got 45 cards back and boy, the ideas. Now it's my job to go in and now let the leadership know there's some patterns here that you can address that can improve not only the working environment, but that can also improve the process. And so yeah. people, I think, yeah. you, know, you know, you quote at one point in the book, Stephen Covey, and obviously he was a great man. I love him. Totally. He talked about in, in his book, The Eighth Habit, right? He talked about everybody has a voice and, and, and wants to express. Yeah. And yeah. Um, leaders, good, great leaders have an opportunity to allow that to be magnified. Yes, right? yes, yes. By the way, Steve was one of the reasons I wrote the book. Oh. He, he, he kept on after me for 10 years and said, you should write a book, you should put in writing and so and And I never did, and after Stephen passed away, and then, and and this great man, this great thinker, right? I had a bad conscience mm-hmm. that I didn't do the book, and I sat down and started writing. That's great. That's yeah. that's really great. So, who do you think? This is kind of a little bit different, but who do you think shapes the culture with inside companies? Well, it 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 un, it, it undoubtedly comes from the top. It, it's no question. They, 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 it's, it's done, uh, adopted because whatever, whatever the message comes mm-hmm. down from the top, people want to please up, up, up. They want to please all the way down. Right. And as the messages go down, it has been, it is adopted, it's adopted more and more, and it's the culture exists. But of course, it's not one person who does it. You, that's why the alignment overall is so important. There has to be. An, the, the leadership, the top leadership has to have really has to be get together and agonize together what is believed, what they believe, what they don't believe, and be sure it is, is, it is related to the organization. 
if it comes, just comes from one guy, it, it, it's not good because then you will have people work against it. But if leadership truly gets together, like develop the vision, develop the mission, develop the, the belief people, right. de, uh, develop the minimum standards of the organization together and truly all believe in the same, then it will go in there and, t- and develop the belief of how an organization is managed and develop the alignment. If that is done and then there is true alignment, I mean true alignment, mm-hmm. not the word alignment because it's a buzzword to die today, but alignment means that every employee knows the objective of the company. Mm-hmm. Every employee knows the mission of the company. Every employee knows what the customer thinks. Well, then you're aligned. Then you're aligned. But this, this hardly exists out there. Yeah. In, in, in fact, management doesn't know the vision. I was worked with a company recently, mm-hmm. a pretty f- fine company, success, I mean successful. And they talked about their vision and said, where is it? And here it is. And said, is it well known? Oh, everybody knows it. And I talked to about 20 managers, mm-hmm. department heads, department heads. None of them knew it. Right. None. Well, you're not an aligned organization at that moment. And of course, that's what's, what Kavi always talked about. He always stood up and said, point north, and everybody pointed in a different direction. Mm-hmm. He said, that's how you work. Nobody is aligned. And now, the word alignment is a buzzword, but right. existing, very little. No, that's really powerful. Um, I've run into the same situation where leaders will often, so I'll sit around a boardroom with leaders, and they'll say, oh, no, we're aligned. We know. And I've had two experiences <laughs> yeah. that, stand, that stand out. I, I was in a... It was actually a Fortune 500 company, and I was sitting in the boardroom talking to several of the executives, and I said, I want to know, what is your mission statement? What is your vision statement? And there was a little bit of humming. No one could actually repeat it, right? They had pieces of it, but they couldn't really repeat it. Yeah, they could have. If they would have had the annual report in front of them, they could have opened up and read it. Yeah, exactly. Well, one of the, 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 the vice president got up, walked out of the room, grabbed the plaque on the hallway wall and brought it back in that had that on it. And I just thought, wow, that is um, really amazing. And, I've- and, and in fact, again, I'm, I'm stating that pretty well in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the book, how basically how to do that. I mean, we, we, we didn't start a meeting without reading the vision statement, mission statement. Why would the meeting take place at all? unless it serves the vision of the organization. Totally. So it should be before every meeting, it should be discussed. The values should be hanging in every boardroom, every meeting room. That's it right there. Like you did every 20, every shift repeating one of those. Repeat one of the points. Totally. I mean, it's constant, constant, constant. Exactly. And then, and then living it. So there's not a sense. Oh, oh absolutely. Of, right. Absolutely. Hypocr- hypocrisy will destroy a culture. Right. Yeah. So, and then you quote, and we don't know where the source is, I don't think, but Peter Drucker, you quote in there that it was supposedly said by him that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Right. right. So, geeks right. Are- you know, I mean, there's a, there's a Peter Drucker. I, I think, um, by the way, I think that Peter Drucker and, and, and Kavi were the best organizational thinker in the last century. The, to me, mm-hmm. they're my heroes. I mean, not, not sure. uh, the best is the wrong word. I mean, the best to me. The most right. valuable to me, and that, and and of course, Peter Trucker said that uh, culture eat eat strategy for breakfast. Yes, there can be a strategy, but if the general culture doesn't stand behind it, it won't happen. Right. It won't happen if the general cu- culture l- believes that you should go take care of your customer. Then the, everybody does it. If the strategy says so, that doesn't mean it's going to happen. Yeah. Unless no. the culture believes it. Unless the culture really believes it. All right, that is that is really cool. What what are some myths maybe that you see in the marketplace when it comes to customer service that you see today? Well, well, customer service. It it the, the crazy thing is, even organizations that are clearly and define themselves as service in the service industry. Mm-hmm. When you go. They all hope it happens. Hope is not a strategy. Oh, right. Why wouldn't it happen? The, the customer has three fundamental expectations, no matter what the customer buys from you. 
if it is a truck or a radio or a bottle of water. If you buy that bottle of water, which I give as an example all the time because it's so easy, mm -hmm. if you buy that bottle of water, you have three subconscious expectations that must be fulfilled. And that's one, the product is defect-free. Mm -hmm. You don't want anything to swim in that bottle of water. Right. You have that subconscious expectation. And you have, as an organization, processes to make sure that happens. Mm -hmm. The number two that the customer expects is that they get it timely. They want it now. You want it now when you buy something. You don't want to wait. And there are processes to make sure that happens. And what else do you expect when you buy a bottle of water? You expect the people who give it to you to be nice to you. That piece is called service. Right. Yet there's no process that that happens. And here is the thing. The greatest driver of customer satisfaction and eventually loyalty is the being nice. They will forgive you if something goes wrong with the product and you apologize and replace it. But they will not forgive you if you were not nice. Yeah. It's a great time. Yet that very easy differentiator from the competition, there's no process that that happens, which is stunning. It's totally stunning. Wow. All right. Um, last thoughts on how to deal with grouchy and demanding customer <laughs> yeah well I, as i as i said as we touched on earlier yeah. i have a whole section on that i you have do. a section on problem resolution every employee here's where it came from to give you the background of it and you and, and I, that's why i like it i like to tell stories around it For so sure. people understand it and understand the background and the stories around that one is how we found solution for that is when we had a survey of the question was, what does it mean if you want to feel at home? Because most guests say they want to feel at home. We want to know what it meant. It turned out they didn't want to feel at home. They want to feel like in their subconscious memory, they remember their mother's home, mm. where everything was taken care of the way they wanted. There was food that they liked. There was the, the kitchen was clean. The dishes were clean. The, the grass was cut and they never had to give it any thought how. But the big piece was, if something went wrong and they went to their mom, now they want to feel like with their mother. And if something went wrong and went to their mom and said, mom, there's something terrible that's happened here. What did mom do? She said, come here, come in my arm. Mom never said I called the manager. Mm. So in that moment, we knew that problem resolution means accepting everybody who gets the complaint, owns it, as I explained earlier. Right. And open their arm and say, I am here for you. And as I touched earlier, that takes care of 96% of the complaints. And so, but there are some very crouchy. There are some that you cannot take care of. And we have, to, we have a saying in the industry, and I guess in most cases, the customer is always right. To be honest, that's not true. There are some customers that are not right. Mm -hmm. I, I gave an example there too, I think in the book, yeah. where, where there's one customer complained every day to the manager mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and it was, the manager called me and said, it's impossible, we have to throw this manager out of the hotel, this I guess out of the hotel, which I said only I can do. Mm -hmm. And so he called me, we have to do it because he also pinched the ladies in the club level, club lounge. Wow. I said, he's out. So I told them, double lock the door, but you do it first class. You double lock the door, you order a limousine, you have a limousine waiting, you have a reservation in a nearby first class hotel. And when he comes back and said, my door is locked, he said, yes, we are here to make sure everybody's happy. And this is another attempt to make you happy because everything we did made you unhappy and we're going to now expel you, but here's the limousine is waiting and so on. And of course, a guest like that would find me and he found me. And before I even could say anything, he told me that he will sue me, will own my 
will own our company and so on, so on, so on. Right. And I told them, that's okay. But you understand, I will come to that courtroom with the three ladies from the club lounge that you pinched. They will be there. And of course, you never sued. But about eight months later, my manager in Florida called me, in Naples, Florida called me and said, Horst, I know you don't want anybody expelled, but there is this guest. He complains every morning how bad we are, and he pinched the ladies in the club lounge. <laughs> he said, oh, Mr. Miller is in the hotel. How did you know? I said, here's what happened. He said, here's what you do. Explain the same thing. And when the, when the double lawyer came back and said, my door is locked, he said, yes, we want you to be happy. He said, no, not again. <laughs> and he was gone again. And he never showed up again after that. Maybe he did somewhere, I don't know, but he never complained again. Right. And that, so, so, so this, that exists, that will happen. But we have to still be first class and professional about it. Love it. And, and, and we don't, any complaint we cannot say is a complaint which was an unreasonable guess. Mm -hmm. We have to accept unreasonable guests are very rare. Right. Very rare. Yeah, that's really good. And the, the fact that you said you, being the leader of the organization, was the only one that could, you know, expel a customer. Yeah. Right, expel a customer. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, they had to go to the top for that. But those were the extremes. And that was, wait, it's totally extreme. Yeah. yeah the, w people aren't normally dealing with those extremes. So no, your no. message to everybody listening is be first class. Whatever you do, be first class. Exactly. Imagine if we were first class with the people driving down the road, taking the high road. Or what if we were first class with our children or first class with our spouses or, or our partners or whatever. I mean, imagine what world we would live in if we would rise uh, kind of above this, um, yeah. I don't know, so, sort of a culture right now where we're out to get each other. You know, it's just yeah. uh, imagine what world we could live in if we had done Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's such such terrible service experiences out there that is, I, I, I don't understand how I, I had a reason, not a reason experience. Give, give it just an idea. I had I bought two expensive slacks, expensive. They, and they had to be fitted. And when I picked them up and I paid for the fitting, which right. was kind of strange, but I paid for it because it was a little bit much. When I came back and measured and they were never done, I had paid for it. Yes. So I called and said, never done. And they came back and they basically admitted it and did it again, again, which they didn't. And they wanted to charge me again. <laughs> it must be kidding. And they wanted, no, they insisted on it. I called the department manager. He insisted on it. It's a department store. I finally went to the general manager. I said, I paid for it once and it wasn't done. Now they want to, now they did it. They want to be the wow. second time. Now, now I won't deal with them again. No, no, the people, they were not empowered to say, okay. They just knew there was a work was done and work gets charged. That's all they knew. And they had to insist on, they had no choice. They were not empowered. Is it their fault? No, it's management, it's leadership. Now that is powerful. Great reminders for all of us who are leaders within organizations. Yeah. You, you said Adam Smith, the Scottish economist, was best known for his book, Wealth of Nations. Yet he, was, he considered his earlier book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, in, in 1759 to be superior. One of his brilliant, if unconventional, insights in that book is that human beings cannot relate to orders and directions. They relate <laughs> instead to motives and objectives. I love that. And so we know that for 300 years, and what do we do? We give orders and directions. <laughs> I know. I know, I'm right? I, I, we... And we know for 300 years it doesn't work. And so they've given me, here, here's my motive. Here's, here is the objective, and here's the motive for it. Totally. In effect, in effect you know, we better learn now because the millennials say, what's in it for me? Right. They want to know the motive and the objective and how it, re how it re relates to them. So why not tell them? Oh, man. This is all rich and good stuff. Stuff that if leaders would employ managers, supervisors even. It doesn't just have to be the leader. Sure. It's every uh, level exactly. of the organization. E exactly. In fact, you said in the book, 
uh, and this is in my words, but you said everybody is part of the link of a chain that if you have a bad experience with a waiter, then they're going to assume that the chef uh, may not be doing a great job, him or herself, That's right. That's right. Sure. and vice versa. But So everyone is connected. And even if it's not, I love what you said because I taught it at Bonita Bay um, organization, a, a great golf course down in Florida. We talked about how sometimes people, and they are awesome and have great customer service. It is their hospitality is their focus down there. It's, a, it's one of the top yeah. golf courses in the world. And um, anyway, one thing that was brought up that we really wanted to emphasize is if you're walking down a path and you see a piece of trash on the pathway that someone just dropped something, don't think, what, well, I work in the club, I'm not a grounds person, that's not my job to pick it up. No, it is, <laughs> it's everybody's job. It's everybody's job. Yeah, we're all Inc part of the same team. Including the CEO's job. Mm. Mm. Including the CEO. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and you know, here's the interesting, that's, that's kind of fascinating, and I'm, I'm always pounded about that. I see the people who are leaders, they would automatically bend and pick it up. The managers, not so often. Interesting. There's another thing. The leader is totally involved in the overall success of the organization. The manager is mostly involved in just forcing and, and count the money. Mm. The leader is involved to care about the things that create the money. Right. Mm. So, and you would say... You could be working for the organization, correct me if I'm wrong, no matter how long you've been working for the organization, you may not be a leader by title, although, oh, right? Yeah. You could be a yeah. leader in your small team or in this department over here, right? Well, the, well, let's face it, the most important leadership is leadership of self. Oh, right. What is your vision? What do you want to be? What, I mean, you know, I, I just had a, had a birthday, a round one. And when you come to my age, you look back, you look back sure. and, and, and you can't help, but you will see yourself. What do you want to see when you look back? What do you want to see? Lead yourself toward that point. In that moment, you have a vision. What do you want to see? Do you want to see excellence? Well, then you create excellence and you will see excellence. I mean, a, a leader, the, the leadership itself is the most important leadership. Yeah, but everybody, when you hear leadership, they look at somebody up there. That's a poor excuse right there. Be a leader of yourself first. And of course, a leader that, that has people working for him or her, they should, un un should understand their role, their moral obligation to lead them to what excellence mm. and not just lead them to but doing a job today. That is really powerful. Well, Ports, Mr. Schultze, let me tell you, um, let me just invite everyone to get a copy of Excellence Wins. This is a powerful book, The No-Nonsense Guide to Becoming the Best in the World of Compromise. I tell you what, I have read this book and what powerful nuggets are in here. Things that you as a reader or a leader can apply right away. We might, right, it's just amazing the, 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 the life experience that Mr. Schultz has been able to share. And so let me just say, it has been an unbelievable pleasure to have you on the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. Do you have any last words or anything you'd like to share? Uh, no, not really. It was just, it was honestly a pleasure. I, I forgot even that we were taping here. Yeah, it was just a great conversation. And I wish you and all your listeners great luck what you're doing in your life. Uh, and remember, be a leader of self. That may be the most important thing. That's really great. Thank you for your time. It was a pleasure. And I wish you the very best. And I wish your book great success. Thank you. God bless all you. Right. God bless you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.